So, you guys don't get leftovers because I preached this once already. <laughs> you get the real deal. The first one was just a trial run. <laughs> Hallelujah. It is kind of weird speaking twice. Same thing. I've always had an issue with uh, doing that. And uh, I don't know that I've ever preached the same, well, I think on three occasions I have preached uh, a sermon, a very similar sermon to, you could almost say I repeated it, but somehow that just never says hello to me, and, uh, and so I never did it. I'm not sure why, but whatever. Maybe it's a hang-up, or maybe not, I'm not sure, but... So this is a real test for me, or not a test, it's just something unusual for me to do this. But we will do it our best, hallelujah. And we always do. Bless the Lord. We live in unusual times right now, right now. We live in unusual times. And, uh, and without belaboring a topic, <clears throat> I, I, I do feel to continue with where we kind of were the last several weeks. And, and I like to preface my thoughts with the scripture from Matthew 25. Uh, Matthew 25 should immediately ring a bell with you as to that in that passage in that chapter is where Jesus spoke about end times and what is what the end times will uh, entail some of what it'll entail and and um, and before he speaks of the end times uh, interestingly, he shares the parable of the talents, and the talents, um, it's not our, our abilities, it was a sum of money. A talent was a weight measurement, and it was a weight of like a gold brick, which I had a few of them. And uh, so there were three individuals, they were each given a sum of money, and they were told to do something with it. Um, and the first two individuals were commended in what they did. Uh, we don't know that they did their best. We just know that they obviously did well and they were commended in what they did. Uh, the third individual, he made no effort with what he was given uh, and uh, and he did nothing, so to speak, with what he received, and uh, things did not go well for him. So that passage concludes, and in verse 31, Jesus begins another issue, and he says, Now, when I come back, uh, and <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to judge nations, and and uh, he says they will be gathered before me, these nations, and Canada will be one of those nations, as will every other nation on earth, and some are going to be identified as sheep nations, and some will be as goat nations. So that is in the passage following the parable of the talents. And so he concludes the parable of the talents, by saying, I gave you something to do, you did nothing. And then he goes into the end times. So I, I lay that out as a, a backdrop, as a, as a foundation for what I want to share from here on in. 30 years after the crucifixion, resurrection, ascension of Christ, 30 years you wish you were still 30 years old, most of you, the world was evangelized. In that short period of time, the, the, the message of Christianity, the church, was birthed, and in 30 short years, the world 
was evangelized. So the world at that time included what we now know and refer to as Europe. Those nations in Europe were evangelized. Christianity was a very strong voice in those nations. And evidence of that are the cathedrals that still remain. The, one of the first buildings to go up, the most ornate buildings in that day, was a cathedral. They were large because there were large populace that attended there. They had to be a large building. They were the fanciest building in town and still are to this day. As Canada was developed, as settlements and towns took shape, the first buildings of noteworthiness that were erected were churches. Because in those days, Canada was a Christian nation. The little church on the way to Headley, on the right hand side, on the reserve there, built in 1910, St. Anne's Catholic Parish. The Catholic and Anglican Church here are well over a hundred years old. It's well over a hundred years old. It was very common that when a settlement took shape, one of the first buildings to go up was a church. Hallelujah. In this day that we live in, uh, right now, uh, the voice of the church, and I'm not speaking our voice particularly, or a particular voice, I'm speaking in a general term, the voice of the church in Canada is very faint. What we once had, we do not have any longer. Our voice is faint. We have reduced ourselves to, and again I'm speaking nationally, I'm embracing all the, all the denominations, all those who call themselves Christian. We have reduced ourselves to being good people. What's interesting and worth paying attention to is that all religions, all religions, their focus is that their people are good people. That's the focus of all religions, that we are good people. Because if you're good, then you would be in good standing when you meet your God, whatever that looks like in these religions. So it's important to be good. Christianity has been reduced in the broad scale to being a good person. And in keeping with being good, you don't have to be a Christian to be a good person. You don't have to be a Christian to have a good marriage or raise up upstanding children. True? There's a lot of things we can accomplish by being good, which you don't have to be a Christian to be good and accomplish good things. This is scary because this is where much of the church is. It's just being a good person. But the truth is, you don't have to be a Christian to accomplish these things, as evidenced by these other religions. But if you do want to raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons, lead someone to Christ, and function in the gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit, that does bring it up to a different level where, oh, this is different. And this is what we've lost nationally. Hallelujah.
<laughs> There's a term we use uh, where we say you have your head in the sand, you're not paying attention, you don't want to face reality. And um, it supposedly comes from a picture of an ostrich, which I suspect there might be one. Well, the truth is that ostriches do not stick their head in the sand. If they did, they'd be an easy target for a lion or hyena. Uh, but what they do do, uh, at, at times, if they think it's a good idea, they'll lay flat on the ground and just stretch their neck out and it may, whatever, appear as though they got their head in the sand. It's similar in color, but they actually do not stick their head in the sand. The term applies. So when we use this term and, and we are guilty of this as a church nationally, we have our head in the sand because we don't want to face an, an unpleasant reality. And the reality is that once we once had as a nation, we do not have that any longer. Used to be a day when the church was the center of influence in a community and because every community had a church it was the center of influence in our country. The church was the center of influence in our country. From there, we knew what was right and wrong, what was honorable with respect to marriage, what was acceptable, what was of value, and the value of a human life. This all came from the influence from the church. In 1867, July 1st, our nation, the, the nation of Canada, was formed. Psalm 72 has a passage in there, a phrase in there. He shall have dominion from sea to sea. They took that passage and that was the motto for our country. Our country was formed just after the second awakening, a, a large revival that touched Europe, Great Britain and North America. Our country was formed on the heels of this revival. It was said in that day that to be an acceptable citizen, you were a churchgoer. You went to church. That was the norm. And that's how our country had its beginning. And on those principles, it was founded. The church was the center of influence. What would you guess is a center of influence today? TV. On internet. It's our educational system. It used to be when we sent our youth, our Christian youth, to university, their Christian values were challenged. Now when we send our four and five year olds, our six year olds to school, those values that they cannot defend are challenged. We have given up. Something that was of immeasurable value. Our voice as a church and it has downgraded to where now we have no voice and we are being told how to live. 
Hallelujah. Edmund Burke, born in 1729, Irish philosopher, politician, believer in Christ, he penned these words. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Albert Einstein, born in 1879, he said something remarkable. The world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch without doing anything. The world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch without doing anything. Staggering. So let's go back to our parable of the talents. Two guys give it a good shot. We don't even know if they did their best. All we know is that they obviously did well and they were commended. One fellow did nothing, nothing, and bad was the result. What we have done as a church, in many respects, is, well, can I say nothing? Do I have to say it? If we look where our country is, we can conclude something has gone wrong. Something has gone wrong. We have lost our influence. The church is no longer the center of influence in our communities. And every church, every town has a church. You bet they do. And they have a bunch of them. You bet they do. We've lost our influence in our towns. And subsequently, we've lost it in our nation. The church is no longer the center of influence. You know what's remarkable about this? Is that this happened in a democratic style government. If we'd be in a communist country, pick your favorite or your worst one, we could say, well, I'll tell you why we lost. Like, these guys are killing us. They're taking our kids away from us. We're losing our jobs. We're being thrown in jail. This is why we're struggling. <laughs> This is embarrassing. This happened in a democratic country. We lost our voice. And they didn't take it from us. We did nothing. Oh. Let me throw this on the table. From the beginning of Christianity, to now, Christians, Christian organizations are the largest humanitarian organizations in the world. By that I mean when a country has a flood, a fire, uh, tsunami, hurricanes, whatever, earthquake, and a country, a populace is devastated, Christian uh, organizations rush to their aid. Christians, Christianity, the church, is the largest humanitarian organization in the world, bar none. So, in keeping with that, we have started schools, universities, orphanages, colleges, etc., etc., etc. We, in the past, we have done this. 
in our nation there are still universities many and many hospitals that bear a biblical name a good example for us is St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver started in 1894 by Bishop Paul DeRue still bears a biblical name many schools many universities many hospitals because human nature likes the easy way out we'd rather win the lottery than go to work every day because we like to be taken care of we would like somebody to meet our needs tell us what to do the government has come along and said hey let me help you we'll take over this university we'll take over this hospital we'll tell you what to do just we'll look after your needs you don't have to worry about anything and because there's something in human nature that wants to just take the easy way the church said okay have our university it's yours and they took it and now they're telling us what to do what to say pretty scary and I don't know where I am but don't be afraid my wife can help you if I get really stuck badly <laughs> hallelujah hallelujah so this is how I conclude our country the nation of Canada is in a bad way with respect to where we started what we were founded on we are in a bad way very critical way we can't tell adults how to run their life I can't tell you how to run your life quite frankly as a pastor it's not my job to tell you how to conduct your life it's my job to preach an anointed word that we would have a good song service like we had here this morning thank you Andrea and team and in this atmosphere that the Holy Spirit would have a platform and he speaks to us and he says hey what about that what about well, what about this right he talks to us so that's how it works in the church family that's how it's supposed to work that's why it's important to have a good song service and and good preaching what about the adult out there well you don't tell your neighbor how to live uh, if somebody wants to be an alcoholic well they can be there's it's not a criminal offense if somebody wants to be a drug addict well they can be if somebody wants to live in, in immorality well they can it's not a criminal offense if somebody wants to be gay or lesbian well they can be it's not a criminal offense and we can't say well you can't do that well we can't because they're an adult we're not dealing with children we're dealing with adults and we can't say to them well you can't do that but what has happened is that some of these people groups now come back to us and they're telling us how we're supposed to live how we would raise our children and how we would speak to them and what is politically correct speech this is very interesting this is this is staggering 
that once we were the center of influence and now a very ungodly voice comes to us from a center of influence which is now the influence in our society they come to us and say now this is how you will raise your children starting at four and five years old <laughs> Lord have mercy. Yeah. How did this happen? How did this happen? Because we were given something and we did nothing with it. The church was given a voice. We were given an influence. And we did nothing. The only thing for the triumph of evil, the only necessary thing for the triumph of evil, is that good men do nothing. It is not the wicked who will ruin the world. It is those who stand by and watch without doing anything. <sighs> Hallelujah. So, here we are, little town that most people in Canada would never have heard of because of its insignificance, but I love it here. Little town, amazing church family. We have the best, I'm convinced. We have among the best in our community, we have some of them here, many of the best. And we have a good thing going. People are healed, people are set free, people are delivered, people are moving forward. Uh, we haven't raised any dead recently, but uh, we've healed a few. Uh, people are getting saved. Like we have a good thing going here, and we are in a small town. So not only do we have a good thing going here, which would kind of mislead us as to what the big picture looks like, but we're in a small town and we don't even get exposed to the big picture because we're just so blessed in a small community that way. But the reality is that what we have here is not what is reflected in the big picture. I don't know how we could influence the rest of Canada. <laughs> that probably would be a bit of a stretch. But to say that we can do nothing, I think that's a very misleading pathway to go down. We can do something. If, if it starts on our knees and goes from there, we can do something. And above all, we need to take our voice back. We need to have our voice back. That we can do. To stand for righteousness. To stand for truth. Hallelujah. Fair is fair. If I can't tell you how to live, then you shouldn't be telling me how to live either. Hallelujah. So my prayer, my encouragement, is that we would not have our head in the sand, as it were, but that we would face this reality and realize that we missed the boat. Now, it wouldn't be you and I, but generations before us fell silent. And we cannot follow that pattern, that example. We must, as a church, wake up, rise up to the task, and do something with which we have been given. Hallelujah. Father, I pray again to these precious people that we would find our voice that we would seize the opportunity to speak up for truth and righteousness. That we would pray. That we would hold back forces of darkness. In Jesus' name. That we would be the church triumphant. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you for these good people. Thank you for this church family that is so precious to you and that we hold to one another.
Thank you, God, and I bless him in your name that we would have a great week, a successful week in whatever we embrace, that it would be successful and blessed. I pray safety over each one. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.